Syncope, or fainting, is when a person loses consciousness and muscle strength. It usually comes on quickly, doesn't last long, and there's usually a spontaneous recovery requiring no resuscitation. It's caused by a decrease in blood flow to the brain, usually due to low blood pressure. There's also presyncope, which is near loss of consciousness with lightheadedness, muscular weakness, blurred vision, and feeling faint without actually fainting. Presyncope can lead to syncope, so you can think of it as a spectrum of the disease. Neurocardiogenic, vasovagal, and reflex syncope are the most common causes of syncope, and this is a benign condition triggered by parasympathetic activation resulting in vagus nerve discharge. This discharge might be in turn triggered by urination, defecation, coughing, prolonged standing, or a stressful event like seeing blood in needles. Carotid sinus hypersensitivity is a variant of neurocardiogenic syncope, and that's when mild external pressure on the carotid bodies in the neck is enough to induce this reflex response. It can be triggered by a tight collar, shaving, or head turning. Most patients with neurocardiogenic syncope experience a prodrome, which is a period of symptoms lasting at least a few seconds just prior to losing consciousness. The prodrome is usually associated with a precipitating event, and it might include dizziness or lightheadedness, a sense of being warm or cold, pallor, nausea, abdominal pain, sweating, palpitations, visual blurring, having poor hearing, and hearing strange sounds. In neurocardiogenic syncope, there's usually a normal physical examination and a normal ECG. And the good news is that these patients usually recover quite nicely. Another common cause is orthostatic hypotension which is defined by either a drop in blood pressure of more than 20 millimeters of mercury or a reflex tachycardia of more than 20 beats per minute, when a person goes abruptly from lying down or sitting to standing up. It happens when there's a delay in constriction of the lower body veins, which is needed to maintain an adequate blood pressure when changing position to standing. As a result, blood pools in the veins of the legs for longer, and less is returned to the heart, leading to a reduced cardiac output. And there's also typically a set of prodromal symptoms that a patient feels before fainting. The main cause of orthostatic hypotension is low blood volume due to dehydration, which doesn't really affect constriction, but if you have low blood volume plus blood pooling in the veins, then there's less blood available in the systemic circulation. Elders, pregnant women, and patients taking certain medications are predisposed to develop symptomatic orthostasis, including medications that block vasoconstriction, like calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, alpha blockers, nitrates, diuretics, which affect volume status and electrolyte concentrations, and medications that prolong the QT interval like antipsychotics and antiemetics. Other causes of syncope include psychiatric conditions like anxiety and panic disorders. And these patients are generally young, without cardiac disease, and typically have multiple episodes. Metabolic causes of syncope include hypoglycemia and hypoxia. And finally, drugs of abuse and alcohol might cause a transient loss of consciousness, as well as signs of toxicity. Typically, when that's the cause, patients don't return to normal neurologic function immediately after regaining consciousness. And to make matters worse, alcohol can also contribute to orthostatic hypotension by impairing vasoconstriction. An important, life-threatening cause of syncope is cardiac syncope, which includes arrhythmia, ischemia, valvular abnormalities like aortic stenosis, cardiac tamponade, and pacemaker malfunction. Risk factors for cardiac syncope include a strong family history, so having a close relative with sudden cardiac death or myocardial infarction before 50 years old, history of heart disease, and symptoms consistent with heart disease like chest pain, palpitations, or shortness of breath. Arrhythmia is the most common serious cause of cardiac syncope, but it can be intermittent and require cardiac monitoring. Another life-threatening cause of syncope is a pulmonary embolism which happens when an embolus suddenly gets lodged inside a pulmonary artery or arteries, causing hypoxia. 
Also, a severe hemorrhage can cause hypovolemia and result in syncope. Additional systemic causes include trauma, gastrointestinal bleeding, a ruptured aortic aneurysm, and a ruptured spleen. Patients with syncope and a very strong headache could have a possible subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, syncope is a common complaint in the emergency department. So the first thing to do is to distinguish if this is actually true syncope or not. Conditions that mimic but are not true syncope include seizures, stroke, sleep disturbances, and accidental falls where there's a head injury. Key features of the medical history include the number, frequency, and duration of episodes, as well as the period of time over which they've been happening. It's important to find out about the onset, because most patients who experience syncope have a prodrome. Patients with prodromes are more likely to have neurocardiogenic syncope or orthostatic hypotension, where it's a sudden loss of consciousness without warning or prodrome suggested arrhythmia. It's important to ask for potential triggers that might suggest the cause. It's helpful to know the patient's position, so supine, sitting, or standing at the time of syncope, along with any recent changes in position prior to syncope. For example, neurocardiogenic syncope commonly happens after standing for 15 to 20 minutes, and almost never when supine. Orthostatic hypotension is frequently associated with the change from a supine to standing position. On the other hand, syncope that happens while the patient's sitting or supine and not necessarily changing positions suggests an arrhythmia. Next up is the physical exam. Worrisome signs include abnormal vitals and an abnormal cardiac, pulmonary, or neurologic exam. Transient hypotension or bradycardia happen during most syncopal events, but usually return to normal, so persistently abnormal vital signs are unusual. A drop in systolic blood pressure of at least 20 millimeters of mercury or diastolic blood pressure of at least 10 millimeters of mercury when going from supine or seated position to standing defines orthostatic hypotension. On cardiac auscultation, pathologic cardiac murmurs could suggest structural heart disease. Patients with syncope return to their baseline neurologic function after the episode. So if there are new neurologic findings, like facial or arm weakness, or dysarthria, which is difficulty speaking, that might suggest a neurological cause for the loss of consciousness, like a stroke or a transient ischemic attack. Finally, it's important to look for injuries which might have happened as a result of the syncope, especially if the person fell. Then an electrocardiogram or ECG should be done in all patients to look for evidence of an arrhythmia, or a new or old heart attack. Sometimes an ECG might not capture an intermittent rhythm disturbance, so if that seems likely, then a Holter monitor can be used. A Holter monitor is like a portable ECG that records the heart rhythms during the day and at night, in order to catch the next syncopal episode that might happen. In individuals where orthostatic hypotension is suspected, a tilt table test can be performed. And that's where a patient lies flat on a special table while getting an ECG and having their blood pressure monitored. The table then creates a change in posture from lying to standing in an attempt to cause syncope. If the patient experiences symptoms associated to a drop in blood pressure, like lightheadedness or even fainting, then a diagnosis of orthostatic hypotension is made. Management focuses on the underlying cause, but oftentimes a clear diagnosis might not be found for many patients with syncope, and it's called unexplained syncope. When there's a clear cause that's not life-threatening, like orthostatic hypotension, a patient may be discharged for outpatient follow-up. On the other hand, if the cause is life-threatening, like cardiac syncope, pulmonary embolism, or a severe hemorrhage, then the patient should be admitted for appropriate management. When the cause is unexplained, high-risk features include an abnormal ECG, history of cardiac disease, especially ventricular arrhythmia or heart failure, persistently low blood pressure, dyspnea, hematocrit lower than 30%, older age and associated comorbidities, and family history of sudden cardiac death. High-risk patients with unexplained syncope should be managed like life-threatening syncope and admitted for management and cardiac monitoring. On the other hand, low-risk patients with unexplained syncope should be managed like non-life-threatening syncope and discharged with outpatient follow-up. 
Finally, when a person has an acute episode of syncope, the goal is to make sure that blood returns to their brain by positioning the person on the ground, with legs slightly elevated or leaning forward and the head between the knees for at least 10 to 15 minutes. In case syncope is caused by cardiac disease, the treatment involves dealing with the underlying cause. So for instance, pacemakers and implantable cardioverter defibrillators to maintain an adequate heart rate depending on the precise cardiac cause. All right, as a quick recap. Syncope is defined as sudden loss of consciousness and muscle strength with fast onset, short duration, and spontaneous recovery requiring no resuscitative efforts. Everyone with syncope needs to have an ECG. If a clear diagnosis of the cause is achieved, then it's called syncope with a clear cause. And we must distinguish benign causes, mainly neurocardiogenic syncope and orthostatic hypotension, from life-threatening causes like cardiac syncope, which require hospital admission and management. 